Good morning. How are you today? I hope you're doing well. Um, man, I've just felt like, uh, I don't know, preparing today, preparing this morning, you know, just uh, coming in and we're singing and doing different things. Um, it just felt like uh, something was holding us back. Yeah, it feels heavy. Good. I'm glad I'm not the only one that feels that. So I think that when we're feeling that way, we need to pray, right? We need to pray and come before the Lord. So let's just take a moment. This is not my normal opening prayer here, but I just feel like we need to pray. So let's just stop and pray. My Father, my God, I just thank you, thank you, thank you that we can come to this building together and worship you. And I thank you that we can just praise you and celebrate you even when it doesn't feel right, even when it feels like something's holding us back. And so Lord, now, right now, as a group, we come before you and just ask for forgiveness. If there's something going on in our lives, we just pray, Lord, take that. We put it at the foot of the cross and just say, Lord, we're sorry. We're sorry that we fail. We're sorry that we have come up short. And we just leave it at the foot of the cross and thank you that your son died and paid for that penalty, whatever it was, that sin that we did. And Lord, I just thank you that you always love us and that your arms always wide open. And we know that you have forgiven us because of your son. So thank you, Lord. We confess that. We, we pray that all the walls that are um, we have built up over this past week or whatever is happening. We just pray that you tear them down so that we can really see you this morning, that we can come before you and just praise you and renew our spirits and fill up spiritually and mentally, emotionally and physically and just come before you and praise you in front of you. And I just pray that you'll just remove whatever's hindering us, whatever's holding us back and just take that away. And Lord, I pray that as we open your word, that we learn more about you, that we can study more about you, and that in doing that will encourage us and realize that we need a Savior and how awesome you are and what kind of character you have. And just thank you that you're that God. We just pray that as we go forward, as we study, that you open our minds and our hearts to wisdom and understanding. As you open, our, open your word, that we may read it carefully that we interpret it correctly and we apply it enthusiastically. May we just uh, um, be raised up this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, this morning, uh, just a quick overview. We've been going over it since, since Easter. We talked about Jesus' crucifixion, then his burial, then his resurrection. And last week we talked about his ascension, how he raised up and you know how we would freak out if we were standing there and we saw someone just levitate up and go into a cloud. We would be going, what is going on? And these uh, disciples were standing there going, what is going on? Wait a minute. We thought you were going to do the kingdom now. I thought you were going to restore Israel. What's going on? And then two angels say, come on, guys. What's the matter? He told you exactly what was going to happen. You need to go into Jerusalem and wait for the coming Holy Spirit, the coming comforter. And so these guys snap out of it, and they go back in. So I have a question for you. Have you ever experienced or believed something uh, really, truly believe, but then you find out it was wrong. You're like, oh, I believe that. The whole, and I have a great illustration. My mom and dad had good friends. It was Joe and Joanne Sarah. And my mom plays the accordion. I don't know if you guys knew that. Yeah, she played the accordion. And uh, she used to do it a lot when she was younger. And uh, she told a story to Joe and Joanne. She said, yeah, I was playing, you know that song, the song that never ends? Well, there's a song that never ends. And she said, well, I didn't know how to end it. So I just kept playing. And the, it was a talent show. And the, the organizer, the main guy, put out a shepherd's crook and grabbed her and took her off stage. OK, and Joe and Joanne, they have a great sense of humor. Uh, they were laughing. I think they've both gone home to be with the Lord now, I think. Well, I'm not sure. I can't remember. Um, but they, they laugh, and they were missionaries. They were missionaries in Puerto Rico at another side of Puerto Rico, and uh, we were good friends. They, they told that story all over the United States on their tours over the churches and stuff. They just thought it was a riot. Well, my mom came down to visit us down in Puerto Rico, and of course, they wanted to see Joe and Joanne. They were good friends for many years ago. They got together, and they said, oh, that was just a great story, Edwina. We just told this story all over. And my mom said, are you serious? That was a story. That was not true. That didn't happen. 
I was just messing around. And Joe and Joanne was like, what? We told that story across the nation. We thought that was a true story. But if you know my mom, she doesn't joke like that very often. So, I mean, she, she told that story, and they believed it, and then they found out it was false. And, but they re told it again and again like it was true. It, it, they, they loved it, and people get, they laughed, they enjoyed it, um, but then they found out it was false. This happens in our modern society, doesn't it? Um, where they're telling you something that's not true, and to believe it. You know, and there's examples all over the place. I mean, cry, uh, the creation. In creation, they tell you, no, no, God didn't do it. It was by chance, because that's more likely. Okay? I mean, that's what they say, and people believe it. They still quote it, even though many scientists are putting that away and saying it couldn't happen. There had to be a design. How about, have you ever heard this? Oh, the riots are mainly peaceful. Yeah, um, that's another, Dan and Molly, they used to live up in Portland, and they experienced the riots of 2020 and 2021. And, and they had people, friends, family members, different people telling them, oh, yeah, it's all peaceful. And are you kidding me? We live in it. It's not, no, no, you're wrong. You know, that's Dan and Molly. They're like, what are you talking about? We're here. It really happened. There's violence. There's things going on. And then all these things, you know, sexual identity. Oh, you can decide if you're going to be male or female. No, God decided that. You're just really going against God when you decide what you're going to do. And then you can't really be that way. Anyway, you can pretend, but you can't. But doesn't that happen a lot in our society? They tell you something is true, and it's not. They tell you over and over, it's true. The Bible is filled with historical stories, historical facts, God's identity, our identity. If you get in this book, it's going to tell you who God is. If you get in this book, it's going to tell you who you are. <laughs> yeah, we need Jesus. We need God, right? Because left to our own devices, we're going to destroy ourselves. It tells you Historical things that happened, and I've told this before, archaeologists, they go to the Bible to go searching for a city to prove it wrong, and then they prove it right. Oh, there is a city there. It was just down farther than we thought. So the Bible's full, and, but the opportunity comes as we study the Word of God, do we always apply it correctly? Because sometimes we don't read it carefully, sometimes we don't let it penetrate us and let us think on it and meditate on it. Sometimes we just are taught wrong. That's why pastors have such a huge responsibility and teachers of God's word have a huge We want to teach you correctly. And don't just take my word for it. What do, you, what do I always say? There, I made my quote. Steve always says, he says that every message. Get in the book. Well, that's why it's so important. Because this is the authority, not me. If I say something wrong, if I say something contrary to this, which is right? The Bible's right, not me. And that's why we need to study God's word. We need to get in the book. And when we study this and we don't apply it, we don't, we don't study it well, we don't learn from other people, we have factions. That's why we have a lot of denominations. Because one denomination says, this is the most important thing. Another denomination, this is the most important thing. And they emphasize all things, but it's all God's word, right? And what unifies us is not the doctrine, it's Jesus Christ. When we get to heaven, we're not going to be in sections of, you know, Baptists, Pentecostals, Independents. We're not going to have these, in, we're going to all be together glorifying Christ. Now, saying that, you might think, well, John, then why do we study the Bible? Because this helps us understand what, how we're to act. How do we react to people? How do we react when we get wrong? How we act to people when we wrong somebody? That's why it's so important to get in this book. I'm not going to, I'm going to present a view that I personally believe about the Bible, okay? And, it, and the way I believe this, it, it answers a lot of questions. Okay, it answers a lot of questions of mine. Because I don't know about you, but I don't like questions that just say, well, 
sorry, we don't really understand that. I want to figure it out. Now, there's things I can't understand, like God being three in one. How does that work? I don't know, you know? And we have these ideas, you know, somebody said it was like an egg. Somebody said it was, um, I can't even remember. Water. Water, like water. I, all these different ideas on trying to explain God, but it's using a physical thing trying to explain a spiritual, all-powerful being. It falls short, right? So we got to take some things by faith. But there's some things in here that are, that are clear if we study God's Word. If we open God's Word and study it. So I'm asking you to listen to what I'm going to share with you this morning. Because we're going to be talking about Pentecost. And you don't know what that is? Don't worry, we'll get to it. And I'm going to present this, and then my thing about this is what? Get in the book. Is what I'm saying true or not? Pray to the Holy Spirit to understanding of his word. Guess who teaches us about God's word? The Holy Spirit. So he's the ultimate teacher, right? So as we open it, we need to have, Holy Spirit, please teach me. Help me see these. And talk and discuss with other believers. i got to tell you, Wednesday night, uh, we kind of went down for a while, but now we've gone up and we have a great discussion. We have 12 people there. We're looking for more people who want to come and just talk about God's word. We usually discuss the sermon, but usually not. We get on a tangent. We go off the side, really, and we start talking about other spiritual truths, which are great, and we love it. But I'm encouraging, we need to talk and share our ideas. I'm getting together with another pastor, and we're going to talk theology with the idea of not trying to convert each other to our theology, but to try to understand where their perspective was and how we've been taught and where we've been growing up. And I, I love that. Why? Because God says we're unified in the body. Iron sharpens iron. iron. But we're supposed to be unified in Christ, not unified in doctrine, unified in Christ. And then the doctrine we're supposed to grow together. And here's the problem. Some of us say, oh, no, no, you're not growing fast enough. Grow faster. Or you're not growing like me. That's the wrong way. Really? Who's ultimately in charge of our growth? Lord. Holy Spirit, the Lord. He's in charge. And yet we put expectations and demands on people, right? Now we encourage people. I say get in the book. I say memorize. I say pray. I acknowledge God who he is. I encourage all those things. But I don't make you. And I don't judge you. You have to seek God. And how do you want me to grow? So if you have your Bibles, open it up, and we're going to go through, I hope, I hope the smell of the uh, upcoming meal doesn't overpower you, because we're going to be here a while, all right? I'm sorry, I hope you brought a snack in your purse or something. Here we go. Acts 2, all right, and we're starting in verse 1, and it starts out, we're going to read a lot here, so get ready. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers who were meeting together in one place, suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames of tongue of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, El Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Ju Judea, Capricondia, Pontus, and province of Asia, Pygra, Pamphylia, Egypt, and areas of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. And we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean, they asked each other. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, they're just drunk, that's all. Isn't that interesting that they said that, they're just drunk? How many people do you know that get drunk and start speaking in a language you can understand? It's usually in a language we don't understand. But I want to get up. Pentecost means 50th. Okay, and here's something. It literally means the 50th day after Passover. So at Passover, Jesus had the Passover lamb with his disciples. 50 days from that point was Pentecost. So he has risen from the grave. He's appeared to people for 40 days. And now we're in the 50th day after 
after the Passover. It was also called the Feast of the Harvest, Feast of Weeks, Sabbat, and the Day of First Fruits. This was to mark a week-long harvest celebration. God was going to take full advantage of this first, first, first fruit celebration. Why? Because Jesus was the first fruit of the resurrected life. Jesus was the first one resurrected from the dead to live forever. He raised other people from the dead, but guess what? They died again. Jesus, when he was raised, lived for eternity. That's what our hope is. That's why we're excited, and that's why we're here celebrating. And we have some things I want to point out in this passage right away. It said, suddenly, this was unexpected. They were not expecting this to happen. They were just going about their life. Another celebration. Have you ever done that? You're just going about life, and all of a sudden, God breaks in? And you're like, whoa, where did that come from? Thank you, Lord, for that unexpected blessing. And what suddenly happened? A roar of a mighty wind. Think of a jet engine. People that have been in tornadoes have described that. It's so loud and it gets scary. When we were in Puerto Rico, hurricanes would come and my father-in-law and I would be out there in the hurricane walking around doing stuff. My wife did not enjoy that. She was inside around concrete walls being safe. And she goes, you're crazy. Just come back alive, okay? So, yeah. The mighty wind, it roared like that. And then they saw in the room that they were in flames or tongues of fire. This is a visible manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Everyone could look at everyone else and see the flame of fire, the tongue falling on each one of them. So they could see in others that the Spirit was falling upon them. Then they all heard, saw, and said something. Every believer experienced this indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Everyone that put their faith in Jesus Christ, seen him and said, he is alive. They experienced the Holy Spirit. And then everybody else, when they came running, they heard their own native language. These people that heard them speaking experienced a miracle of tongues. Because not that they only hear like English, they heard southern United States English or hillbilly hick, or people from Wisconsin, heard their, or from the Oregon, or from Alaska. They heard their native tongue, their dialect. And they were amazed because they said, these guys are Galileans. What good is Galilee? These guys are the backwards hicks. And then they said, how can this be? How can this be? Have you ever heard the world try to explain away a miracle? They explained it away with what? Oh, they're drunk. That makes sense. Oh, creation just happened. It came from nothing. That, that makes sense. They tried to explain it away because if they acknowledge that Jesus does a miracle, that God can do miracles, what do they have to do? They have to find out about this God, this creator, and they have to make a decision. Are they going to follow them or not? And then it finally says, Jews and proselytes. This was strictly a Jewish gathering. They were in Jerusalem. This was a celebration. They kept the outsiders out. You had to be a proselyte. Proselytes were Gentiles who were now considered Jews. Gentiles who believed in God and showed their faith in God by following the laws of Moses. There's examples of this in the Old Testament. Rahab and Rahab's family. In Jericho... The Israelites were coming, they were going to defeat the first city, and they were marching around, and, but they, before they did that, they sent spies in. And Rahab saw the spies, covered them up, hid them, and then sent them on their way, but said, remember us when you come. And they did. The whole, everybody in their house were saved. And guess what? Rahab became part of the line of Jesus, the, the human line of Jesus. That's awesome. And then there's Ruth. Ruth, again, a Moabite. Someone that's supposed to be, look away, look away. But she came with her mother-in-law because every, all the men are dead in their family. He comes, they come back and they find a, a, an uncle who was supposed to be a redeemer and redeemed Ruth, became her husband. And guess what? Ruth 
was in the line of the Messiah, of Jesus. Awesome. But they followed Jewish tradition. Ruth even declares, Naomi, your God will be my God, your people, my people, where you live, I will live. So this is all Jewish, and this is going forward. Let's keep on going. Verse 14. Then Peter stepped forward with 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, all of you fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, when? God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. And I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red before the great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Isn't that awesome? I mean, that's like a mic drop. You could just walk away from that. It's exciting. But Peter steps forward. I want to say that this is a scary situation for the other disciples. Because remember who Peter is. He's very straightforward, stepping in no matter what, jumping out of a boat, walking on water. He's, go, he's the first one in. And he usually doesn't get it right the first time. It takes three or four or five times to get it right. And he leaps before he understands, and he's out there. But you know what the difference is? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is now indwelling Peter. And he steps forward. I want to tell you something, GBC, church family, that is you. If you have accepted Jesus Christ into your heart, guess where the Holy Spirit is living today? In you. And, you know, can you see, you know, oh, oh Peter's going again. No, they're saying, all right, Peter, go for it. The difference is they know the Holy Spirit. And I want to tell you, you can feel like, I don't feel qualified, John. I'm, I, I don't have the education. I've, I've just been newly saved, or I've just, been, I've just been recommitted to Christ. Guess what? The Holy Spirit's in you. He can do it through you and in you. You can say, oh, others are better. Uh, really? You have the Holy Spirit. God can't use me. You don't know how bad I am. Really? The Holy Spirit is living in you. This is scary. Yep. But you know what? You have the Holy Spirit living in you. Are you getting the point here? You have the Holy Spirit in you. You can do it. Because it's not in your power. It's in God's power. We're going to be, in the next few months here, we're going to be starting putting leadership into place as elders and things. And i got to tell you, all the men that are in eldership training class, they have said, John, I'm not qualified. Look at this. I can't, I don't live up to this. How can I live up to this? This is impossible. Jesus is the only one that fits. I said, yeah, that's correct. Welcome to the club. I can't reach that standard either. You know what God says? Be on the path. Because guess what? Do we fail? Can we be restored when we fail? Yes, we can. It's how we react when we fail. That's what God's interested in. How do we react? And that attitude of, I'm not worthy, I can't do it, that should be the attitude. That's what makes you qualified. You know why? Because when you say that, I can't do it, I, I, you know who you have to rely on? The Holy Spirit. And that's, I would much rather have a bunch of men relying on the Holy Spirit than one that says, hey, I'm qualified, I got all the education, I'm ready to go. You know why? Because one is pharisaical, one is the disciples. Next one, fellow Jews and residents. This is Peter. He's talking to people. He's saying, hey, this is totally, G G totally Jewish. Normal Gentiles are not in the equation. He is talking to his fellow Jews. That's important. Who is the message to? It's to his Jews. And then he says, this is predicted a long ago by the prophet Joel. Joel predicted this. It's prophesied in Joel 2, 28 and 32. 
We have a lot of verses, but write it down if you want it. Joel 2, 28 through 32. It's there. It says verbatim what he said. In the last days, this is another phrase, in the last days, with the Holy Spirit's guidance, Peter is preaching a sermon, quotes what's going to happen in the last days of history. This is supposed to be the beginning of the end. And listen to this. I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, and they will prophesy wonders in heaven above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark. The moon will turn to blood. Before the great and glorious day of the Lord arrives... But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Does this sound familiar? This is happening in Acts 2, 50 days after um, the crucifixion. John writes about this some 60 years later in Revelation. And here's the thing. Some of the things, I'm going to start walking on some things that maybe be controversial, but I think it explains a lot. Revelation has not happened yet. It may be obvious to some of us, but some people believe it's happened. I'm telling you, Revelation has not happened yet. It's still to come. And Peter, Holy Spirit, through Peter, is telling us about what's going to come in the future. Don't you realize, guys, this is what's happening. The Holy Spirit's supposed to come. We're supposed to dream dreams. And then there's going to be signs and wonders before Jesus comes back. Does that sound like they're ready for Jesus to come back? They're like, come on, guys. This is what, don't be surprised. We're going forward. Okay, Acts 2. We're still in Acts 2. We're going to read all of Acts 2 or most of it. Here we go. People of Israel, listen, God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him. As you well know, but God knew what would happen, and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was portrayed with the help of lawless Gentiles. who You nailed him to the cross and killed him. What did he just say there? You, who, who nailed him? You did. He's pointing right at the Jews. You did this. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in its grip. Isn't that great? Isn't that great that Jesus is alive today? Come on, guys. That should be exciting. Yes. King David said this about him. I see the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and my tongue shouts his praises. My body rests in hope, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You have shown me the way of life, and you will fill me with joy of your presence. Dear brothers, think about this. We can, you can be sure that the patriarch David wasn't referring to, to himself, for he died and was buried, and his tomb is still here among us. But he was a prophet, and he knew God had promised with an oath that one of David's own descendants would sit on his throne. David was looking into the future and speaking of the Messiah's resurrection. He was saying that God would not leave him among the dead or allow his body to rot in the grave. God raised Jesus from the dead, and we are all witnesses of this. Now he is exalted to the place of highest honor in heaven at God's right hand. And the Father, as he has promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us, just as you see and hear today. For David himself never ascended into heaven, yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit in the place of honor, at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool on your feet. So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. Isn't that awesome? Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. Christ is the Greek word for Messiah, and Messiah is the Hebrew word for Christ. Okay? It's describing the same thing. The Holy Spirit, through Peter, preaches a sermon, a proof that Jesus is the Christ. Five points in his sermon. Here we go. Five points. First, authenticated. God proved that Jesus is the Son of God. How? 
powerful miracles, wonders, signs, and through, through everything that he did, through his voice, through everything, he proved that it was him. Even Jesus said, if you don't believe what I say, believe what I've done. That's what he said. Can't, can't you believe? I mean, when people are seeing, people are hearing, that's what he proved to, to John the Baptist. Remember when John the Baptist had a little frightening, you know, he wasn't sure, is this really going on? Is, this, is he truly it? And Jesus said, go back and tell John the sight, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, and the good news is preached to the poor. Isn't that awesome? The second thing is crucified. And look at this. I'm just, but God knew what would happen, and a prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you, you nailed him to a cross and killed him. Was the crucifixion an accident? Was it like, oh, God, you blew it? That was his plan all along. Because if Christ didn't die, if the Son of God did not come and die for us, we would be hopeless. Because there's not one human being in all of creation that can stand up and take the punishment that we deserve. Jesus, the Son of God, was the only one that could do it. And thank you, Jesus, that he did. Right? I mean, that's why we can go to heaven someday. Come on, that's exciting. I, wow, that's awesome. Then the third thing is resurrected. Once again, prophesied by King David. I mean, Jesus told his disciples that it was in the Old Testament. It was predicted. Jesus is going to rise. The Messiah is going to rise again. Did anybody get it? Not until it happened. This was not a defeat. This is a victory. The disciples need to understand that. And now the world needs to understand this. You need to understand that the cross is not a symbol of defeat. It's a symbol of our redemption. That's why we can wear a cross. Oh, you shouldn't wear a cross. It's a symbol of defeat. No, it's a symbol of our salvation. The proof is the grave. The cross was the actual payment. Fourth, ascended. Once again, prophesied by King David. This is all prophetic. God is going to set the stage for his son's return. He's going to set the stage. There's things that need to happen. And I'll give you a, one thing that I, bothered me growing up. I was like, when we studied Revelation in our church. I, I had a church that was really head knowledge, okay? We studied Greek when I was 16 in a Sunday school class, all right? So we were like, you know, that, that was it. One of the things that bothered me about Revelation is that it said everybody in the whole world was going to see these two witnesses that were going to do great things. I mean, awesome, terrible, marvelous things in God's name. Keeping, keeping rain from falling on the earth. Causing fire to happen. Just doing a bunch of things. Just detriment to the earth. And the Antichrist is going to come and kill them. And it's going to say that every person on earth saw it and they rejoiced. And they celebrated like Christmas. They were giving gifts back and forth to one another because these guys, they felt, were the stain on humanity. And I was, always thought, what, is everybody going to have a television? How are, how are people in Africa going to see this? They don't have television over there. You know, I mean, it's very rare. So how is everybody going to see it? God answered that question. Because my African missionary friends say... This is how they do business over in Africa. The shepherds and everybody, that's how they get paid, is by phone, by transferring the money on the phone. So even poor, poor people have it because they become so dependent upon it. Okay, once again, is God proven right? And all men are proven liars, right? I go, God, this is an impossible problem. How are you going to solve it? Ding. Okay. So God is setting the stage for his son's return. And there has to be certain things that happen for the second coming when Jesus comes and reigns in Jerusalem, sits on the throne of David. Things have to happen. And the fifth thing is glorified. He is now sitting at the right hand of the Father. Jesus is worthy. Jesus is worthy of that glory. Once again, you have to go back to Revelation. 
There was no one found worthy to end history until Jesus came along. And this happens in Revelation 5, verses 4 through 8. John the, John the Apostle, he's, in, he's taken up to heaven. I don't know if it was a spirit or he, he was in heaven, okay? And he was seeing what was going on. And God the Father was sitting on the throne with the scroll for the end times to finish history. And nobody was found worthy to open it. And John fell on his knees and just cried because he knew that meant our death and destruction. Everybody. A death and destruction. We couldn't, we couldn't pay the penalty. But then he saw a lamb who had been slain. The elder described it as the Lion of Judah. That's Jesus Christ. But John saw a lamb that had been slain. And he came and he was worthy. And the scroll was put in his hand and everybody's had a new tune. They started singing Jesus' praise because he was the only one worthy to end time. To put a, put a payment on our penalty and to end to come to conclusion of time. So the conclusion is this. Verse 37, Peter's words pierced their heart and they said to him and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, to your children, and to those far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all the listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to, to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. So let everyone in Israel for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Isn't that an awesome sermon? I want to ask you, have you ever felt guilt or an internal nudge or conviction? Have you, have you ever done something and all of a sudden you're like, oh, I shouldn't have done that? Have you ever reacted to somebody and then you look, I hope no one saw me? Have you ever gotten angry at your family and then you're like, oh, why did I do that? Aren't you glad we have a Savior that forgives those sins? <laughs> But you're like, oh, why did I do that? But I have an interesting thing about this situation. You know, when we have guilt like that, when we have like the Holy Spirit knocking on us and saying, hey, guess what? God still gives us a choice. And that choice is this. Do you act on that feeling or that prompting or do you suppress it? Do you quench the Holy Spirit or obey the Holy Spirit? These Jews were feeling it. <laughs> they were like, oh, we crucified the Messiah. There's nothing we can do. We're done. What are we going to do? What can we do, Peter? What can we do? <laughs> Peter is right there with the answer. Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is the first message after the Holy Spirit has come. Do you think God's involved? I think the Holy Spirit's involved in this message? Or do you think, oh, Peter, go ahead, you got it. Boy, that would be dangerous, right? Putting... Does the Holy Spirit make mistakes? Are you sure? You believe that. He's God, right? He doesn't make mistakes. Does the Holy Spirit give misguided information? What does the Holy Spirit say here? He says five things here. Repent of your sins. What does repent mean? It means turning away. It can also mean being sorry. It means a change of direction, 180 degrees. Stop going this way, go this way. Make it you turn turn towards God. Turn to God. That was the second thing. Turn. Repent of the sin. Stop going this way. Turn and turn to God, not turn to another sin. Turn to God. That's number two. Number three, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. 
Water baptized. And then it says, for the forgiveness of sins. And then, the last thing is, then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is the order of events of salvation that the Holy Spirit preached on the Pentecost. I want to ask you, and see, this is, I don't like contradiction, because God is not a God of contradiction. When did you receive the Holy Spirit? When you believed. Not when you baptized. Not when you did the turning. It's when you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. John, that's a contradiction. What's going on? Because that order that the Holy Spirit, we just proved, we just said, the Holy Spirit doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't give erroneous instructions, right? How does that, what, what does that mean? I'll answer that in a second. The number added to what? Church. Yeah. In this translation, it says church. You know the word for church in Greek is ekklesia. And ekklesia is really a, just meaning a gathering people, a called out group. They say church, but it's a called out group, a group of like-minded going, going towards a point, going towards a direction. This word ekklesia is not found in verse 41 that I just read to you. And that was earth shattering to me. Wednesday night, told, I told him on Wednesday, I learned something in my study that blew me away because I was always taught that in verse 41, it was 3,000 believers were added to the church. And I just took it on his word until I started studying, until I got in the book. Now, I want to say something real clear here. I've said it before. Do I care what translation you use to get in the book? What's my concern? Get in the book, all right? You use New Living Translation, you use King James Version, you use English Standard Version. If you use the message, which is a paraphrase, I want you to get in the book, because you know what that's going to do? It's going to create a desire to learn more. I had a very good friend that he started reading. He, he was all oh, anti-religion and everything, but then he got saved. And then I said, you got to get in the book. He said, I hate the King James Version. I said, here, read the message. He started reading the message. He started reading it. And then he said, as he started to grow in Christ, he's like, I want to know what it really says here. So then he got a, a new, uh, um, new American, or a new um, NIV, New International Version. I couldn't even say it. <laughs> couldn't remember that. Anyway, got an NIV. He started reading the Oh, that's what that means. And now, guess what? He's using four different translations to look into God's word. My concern is first getting the book because God is going to help you grow in the book. And he's going to put that desire, if it's truly you're searching for him, he's going to create that desire to know more and more and more. This is significant. The Greek says that 3,000 souls were added. Believers. And that's significant, I think, because people got saved. Are they going to Spend eternity with God? Yes. That's important to understand. They're saved. Did, did Jesus save people before he died? Well, he made declarations. Remember the paralytic? Before he healed him, what did he say? Your sins are forgiven you. Do you think it was just up to that point? Because he knew, Jesus knew he wasn't going to sin after that? Jesus sinned, after, or not Jesus, the guy sinned after that. He knew. Your sins are forgiven you. And then the Pharisees, oh, you can't do that. And what does Jesus say? Is it easier to forgive someone of their sins or to say, take up your bed and walk to prove that I am the Son of God and I can forgive sins? Take up your bed and walk. And he got up and walked. People are saved, they're going to spend eternity with, with God. People are saved because of his death on the cross. And the only way you're saved is by believing on Jesus Christ, having faith in that act. But I want to tell you something. 
at this time, at this time, this was all Jewish. The church, that word church, doesn't happen until chapter 4 or 5. That word, church. And then we have to determine what that word church means. Is it the body of Christ? Or is it the Jewish church? Everybody's like, hmm, I've never thought about that. Good, because May 8th, on Wednesday night, we're going to be starting talking about that. And you guys can interact and talk and ask questions and say, what is that? How does that work? What does that mean to me? Okay, shameless promotion. But I don't care. Because what we're talking about is growing in Christ. And even if you decide what I'm saying is wrong, I want you to come to better understand how you believe the Bible. That's how I challenge myself. I go to other pastors and ask them, how do you view this passage? And I may not agree with them. Guess what? We're still celebrating because we're going to heaven together. So May 8th, and then four weeks following, two hours, 6 o'clock at 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. And we'll honor that time. It'll be two hours. I'll have handouts. I'll have things that you can look at and you can study. And I want to encourage you, even in this, is God glorified? God is glorified. People are saved. People are coming to Jesus. Their sins are forgiven. I want to ask you, have you done that? Have you come to Jesus and asked for your sins to be forgiven? Have you accepted Jesus, that he died on the cross and rose again for you? And people that are saved, people that believe this, People, are we telling others about Jesus or not? Five people, tell them. Tell them about how Jesus has changed your life. Because you know what? Jesus can change their lives. Amen. My Father, my God, I thank you for this lesson. And Lord, I'm, I just pray that as we study God's word, as we open the book, as we look for more knowledge about you and what you want us to do in this day, in this present time, I just pray that you'll keep us humble, keep us looking, keep us searching for the scripture, keep us focused on your son. And Lord, I pray that this doesn't divide us, but this unites us in knowledge about you and understanding how you have shared your word for us. Lord, protect us as we study, guide us as we study, and Lord, you receive the glory and the honor. May we read your word carefully. May we interpret it correctly. And Lord, finally, may we apply it enthusiastically. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.